James Otis and the Writs of Assistance. That's the topic of conversation on today's Brush Fires of the Mind, The Dave Benner Show, a podcast where we explain that liberty, once lost, is lost forever. Now, the federal government regularly assures us that the NSA warrantless surveillance is perfectly constitutional and necessary for our safety. You know, politicians, government officials, and media outlets are constantly telling us that if government doesn't have this type of power, citizens will fall prey to terrorist atrocities or attacks from the outside. Um, As a result of this policy and institutions like the NSA, unfortunately, our privacy is no longer private. Instead of providing protection, those types of enactments work to gradually erode our liberties, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. Really, in their very essence, these attacks are from the inside, from the government, the very government that was the creation of the states. Well, I say that begrudgingly, but in the 1760s, the situation was just as dire. In order to enforce its coercive means of taxation, British Parliament, during this time, enacted the Writs of Assistance. What these were were court orders that really provided legal sanction for any official of the British government to enter the homes of colonists they suspected uh, were hiding information, refusing to adhere to the tax codes, or just basically being deviant. Now, the Ritz acted to provide all British officials with the ability to essentially snoop on people. It even made the military members able to write their own warrants without a judge and go into people's houses. And they're really suspecting people's personal effects, their items, their houses. Every deed, every paper was searched. Well, this was considered abominable. This was really done to ensure compliance with the controversial means of taxation, like the Stamp Act and the Townsend Acts. Consequently, the British authorities urged that these measures were necessary to provide you know, stability to the government and security for its citizens. They were really just worried more about smuggling and resistance to their unjust taxation schemes and purchase mandates. Parliament thought that that was really an appropriate way to deal with this type of you know, colonial conflict, this resistance to their taxes. Well, thankfully for us and our history... James Otis Jr., who was a patriot lawyer and unwavering firebrand of liberty, did not. From Boston, Otis was a notable player in how the situation developed there when it came to rejection of the writs of assistance. He was one who stubbornly defended the people's liberties, arguing that the writs invalidated the British Constitution. He really fought vigorously against this. In one case in 1761, in a court case, he argued for hours against the legitimacy of the writs at the old state house. Now, while five judges eventually decided in his case to uphold the constitutionality of the writs, surprise, surprise, and Otis lost the case, he made an extremely compelling argument and a potent impression on compatriots that would come after him. One of those compatriots was a young John Adams who happened to be in the crowd and saw Otis as he was making the arguments. And John Adams wrote afterward that American independence was then and there born. The seeds of patriots and heroes to defend their vigorous youth were then and there sown. Every man of immense crowded audience appeared to me to go away as I did, ready to take arms against the writs of assistance. Mr. Otis's oration against the writs of assistance breathed into this nation the breath of life. So you can see how powerful Otis's arguments were. It has been said that Otis's speech was the first living voice which called to resistance. First Boston, then Massachusetts, then New England, and then the world. Historian John Morris described the oratory as the first log of the pile which afterward made the great blaze of the revolution. So this was very, very, very powerful. And for some reason, we don't hear much about Otis today. But what he fought for was really the impetus for what would come later, which I'll touch on in a second. Otis really realized that liberty was protected by the British constitutional experience. He said these principles and these rights were wrought into English constitution as fundamental laws. And under this head, he went back to the old Saxon laws, to Magna Carta, 
and the 50 confirmations of it in Parliament, and the executions ordained against the violators of it, and the national vengeance which has been taken on them from time to time, down to the Jameses and the Charleses, and the position of rights, and the Bill of Rights, and the Revolution. So he's making references to British's constitutional past, where James and Charles were opposed by the masses because they made similar abridgments. We need to understand that this type of thing is cyclical. It happens in every age. Garments consolidate too much power and deprive people of liberty. Otis later accurately noted that a man is accountable to no person for his doings. One of the most essential branches of English liberty is the freedom of one's house. And that is entirely significant. Really, unsurprisingly, after this controversy and after Otis's arguments, the British Parliament guaranteed to its North American subjects that the policy was perfectly legal and constitutional in 1767. So the colonists have nothing to worry about. This, these schemes known as the writs of assistance are perfectly constitutional. Thankfully, patriots like Otis wouldn't be swayed by such assurances. By 1791, Otis's vigilance helped inspire the Fourth Amendment of the Bill of Rights. Because what that amendment really did was prohibit government from ever coming up with a scheme that would deprive privacy rights of individuals again. It would eventually codify the impossibility for such a program. It's an untouchable thing. And I'd like to just take a moment to kind of dissect the Fourth Amendment because it is a very important one. It is one of the most important aspects of the Bill of Rights that the government can't even approach these types of matters. So let's just dissect the terminology. So the amendment starts, the right of the people to be secure in their persons. That means essentially the right of privacy. Houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. Well, this is basically saying that all the person's items cannot be seized or inspected by the government. The next part of the amendment reads, And no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation. This is basically saying that search warrants can only be executed upon probable cause that one has committed a crime, and that the judgment of a judge is necessary as the judge stands as essentially an intermediary between the government and the individual. Even though the judges are part of government, they're there to provide a check against the overruling authority of centralized power. The amendment continues, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. This is stating that the government has to produce an exact note of what they're looking for and why. Otherwise, the search is illegitimate. We should never really be surprised about the lengths that government will go to to consolidate power and disrupt privacy. I mean, this has happened throughout human history. There's always new schemes to do this. They're just called by different names. All attempts to suppress privacy rights have been tried and tested by p tyrants throughout history. Even going back to King John of England, all oppressive acts have been attempted in the past. There are just new paths to embark upon in the name of tireless resistance against those types of oppressions and that type of subjugation. Unfortunately, we have a new writs of assistance in our own age. And I say that very begrudgingly, but it's called the NSA Warrantless Surveillance Program. That's the new writs of assistance. It's the modern incarnation of the writs of assistance. It's the embodiment of a pervasive government that observes our every move, our every item, our every paper, you know, at will. Thankfully, we have the Fourth Amendment to look back on to assure us that these liberties are inherent in our own humanity. They pre-exist to government, and government cannot so much as touch them. Fortunately, the path that we can use in resistance to this type of program and these types of schemes is nullification. Nullification, a principle Thomas Jefferson acknowledges as the rightful remedy, is the most effective path to oppose such programs. Today, as I'm speaking and podcasting, Tennessee, Utah, and Maryland are all mulling and debating bills 
that would cut power and resources to NSA facilities. These bills should be embraced by us. I just thought this was so powerful and really kind of likened uh, to the situation as it developed in the 1760s where James Otis was enacting obstructions against this type of pervasiveness. And these bills in these states are just so powerful. They're ingenious. The bill in Maryland, for instance, would prohibit the flow of water and electricity to the NSA headquarters. That's so powerful to me. When I saw this article, I could hardly believe it. It's ingenious. And I believe that I read in an article that that facility needs like 1.7 million gallons of water every day to operate, primarily to cool its data centers, which, by the way, are essentially keeping data on all of us, spying on us. The bill's sponsor, Michael Smeagiel, framed the bill so eloquently, and I had to capture this quote and talk about it because it really was powerful and just, it really, you know, took effect. He said, I want Maryland standing with its back to its people holding a shield, not facing them holding a sword. I just thought, you know, we rarely hear politicians talk like this these days. We rarely hear the defense of liberty pronounced in such a way, and I just thought that was so influential. It's very powerful. It assures that the states, as bodies that ratified the Constitution, have a say in what's constitutional or not. Smeagiel really produces an argument that's just as powerful, just as significant, and just as compelling as James Otis Jr.'s stance in 1761. It really is. You know, Smeagiel realizes the malignancy of the NSA's spying endeavors is violative of those principles and those tenets. He really speaks in direct terms to condemn the organization for its acts. We should really applaud this legislation and really support it. Like Otis before them, Smeagiel and the Defenders of Liberty today stand united in their conviction that enough is enough. The American child of independence can be born again. That same sediment produced by a young John Adams can be produced again, but we have to act in concert against these violations. And one of the ways that we can act to employ a systematic rejection of those types of pervasive programs was provided to us in a blueprint by James Madison when he wrote Federalist 46. And I'd like to read from it because it's one of the most important parts of the Federalist because... Madison argues that the states can employ means to obstruct the federal government from enacting tyranny. Here's what Madison wrote. Were it admitted, however, that the federal government may feel an equal disposition with the state governments to extend its powers beyond the due limits, the latter would still have the advantage in the means of defeating such encroachments. If an act of a particular state, though unfriendly to the national government, be generally popular in that state, and should not too grossly violate the oaths of the state officers, it is executed immediately and, of course, by means on the spot and depending on the state alone. Madison went on to write, Should an unwarrantable measure of the federal government be unpopular in particular states, which would seldom fail to be the case, or even a warrantable measure be so, which may sometimes be the case, the means of opposition to it are powerful and at hand. Madison continues by saying, The people, their repugnance, and perhaps refusal to cooperate with officers of the Union, the frowns of the executive magistracy of the state, the embarrassments created by legislative devices, which would often be added on such occasions, would oppose in any state difficulties not to be despised would form, in a large state, very serious impediments, and where the sentiments of several adjoining states happen to be in unison would present obstructions which the federal government would hardly be willing to encounter. I think this is so powerful because Madison is giving us the blueprint for what recourse the states have if the federal government overextends its authority beyond what he said was the due limits. He says that states acting in opposition to officers of the Union would produce a very powerful antagonistic force against those types of usurpations. And that's just an incredible sentiment. Today, Tennessee, Utah, and Maryland are producing these obstructions that Madison talks about, that Madison writes about, and they should be applauded for doing so. 
Do we have the courage to oppose the writs of assistance of our time? Do we have the same resentment and outrage as James Otis Jr. did in his time? Will we point to liberty granted by a just creator and affirmed by the Fourth Amendment? That, those are the questions I want us to answer as individuals. As we live, speak, and work, we are being tested by the same policies as our patriot generation was. What I'd really like the listener of this podcast to take away from today's topic is just the fact that Otis's arguments, his ire, his indignation, his resentment, his agitation toward these unconstitutional aims of the British authority can be employed in our age as well. It's not just reserved for one type of people, one type of age, one state, and one government. These methodologies can be employed today effectively. When it comes to Otis, you know, he inspired the cause of liberty in other ways. Uh, he asserted that blacks had inalienable natural rights, and the whole theme of Otis's pamphlet, The Rights of the British Colonies, expounds upon this. Otis died a fairly young and tragic death. He was actually struck by lightning in a doorway. But the point of this is saying that Otis died, but really the spirit behind his activism never did. His antagonism sparked the ire of patriots in Boston and contributed to the patriot cause. Otis died, but what he fought for did not. His spirit of resistance lived on. Otis proved that ideas are bulletproof. Now, this topic today is one that I wrote about in my next article for the Tenth Amendment Center, which should be appearing shortly on the main site. Uh, my last two articles have appeared adjacent to ones written by Andrew Napolitano, which frankly leaves me quite flabbergasted but appreciative nonetheless. Um, I've had a great opportunity to contribute to that cause. Take a look at my work there at TenthAmendmentCenter.com and really take a look at the efforts that are being sparked in states all throughout the Union when it comes to nullification measures and ways to oppose unconstitutional actions of the government. I'd also like people to be referred to my website, www.davebenner.com. Take a look. Uh, I have more of my articles there, other podcasts, uh, videos of my speeches, etc. I'd love for you to check that out. With that said, we know that there is a passion natural to the mind of man, especially a free man, which renders him impatient of restraint. It's Brushfires of the Mind, the Dave Benner Show. You can't be